This presentation is intended for educational purposes only and is not the only source of information on the topics presented. The producer's company or agency do not endorse or promote any company or product represented. If after viewing this content you have unanswered questions or concerns on any of the topics presented, it is recommended that you contact other recognized experts on the subject. My name is Rob Moreland. I am the EMS Liaison and Injury Prevention Outreach Coordinator for St. Mary's Medical Center. I work for the Trauma Department. Um, my background is fire rescue. I spent 30 years with Delray Beach Fire Rescue. Um, retired Division Chief a few years ago and have been an educator for many years with the various colleges and, and uh, programs around Palm Beach County. So what we're here today, I'm here with Jessica Banks, captain with the Medical Services Division here at Palm Beach County Fire Rescue. And we're gonna to talk to you about the national campaign that we call Stop the Bleed. Stop the Bleed came about after the 2012 Sandy Hook school shooting. After that, there was a great push to create a national program to teach lay persons as well as medical persons on the major techniques for stopping or controlling severe external hemorrhage. And that includes direct pressure, the use of tourniquets on extremities, the use of wound packing with or without hemostatic gauze for the junctional areas of the body, such as the armpits and the groin and the neck. And so we're gonna to talk to you guys and show you each of those techniques from the Stop the Bleed program. And it starts out with the ABCs of bleeding control. The A stands for alert. So just like with any medical emergency, as soon as you recognize that someone is injured or in need of medical help, A stands for alert, and that means call 911. You can't really do this by yourself. You can make a big difference and stop the bleeding, but you're gonna need help. B stands for find the bleeding injury. And that may be more difficult than you think because someone that's covered in blood or has multiple lacerations or multiple injuries, you've got to find the one that's bleeding the most severely. And that might mean wiping some of the blood off of them and looking for the more severe injuries. C stands for compression. compression. And whether that's using direct pressure, compression using a tourniquet, and it's really geared towards lay persons, but also medical people um, need this training as well. Because if you've never used one of these tourniquets, you can't really just look at it and say, I know how to use it. Typically, when we were trained as EMTs and paramedics, we were taught to use direct pressure right on top of a wound to stop external bleeding. But we found that through the um, last 20 years over in the Middle East, that for deep gaping wounds like this, it's better to pack those wounds and then put pressure directly on them, and that distributes the pressure deep down into the wounds. So we'll start with all three techniques and we'll start with extremity injuries. So I'm gonna ask Jessica to be my partner here. And I'm gonna say that she's got a really significant um, laceration to her forearm. So it's bleeding so badly, in fact, she's actually cut an artery there and it's spurting blood. So we're gonna say the laceration's right about there. So just like, every, just like we were all trained, the first thing we're gonna do is start with direct pressure. And anything, any clean cloth, it doesn't have to be sterile, if you're not in, you know, if you're not on the job or you're out in the community or in your car or out on the boat, just grab any clean cloth and start with direct pressure. Ideally, we want to put that direct pressure um, forcefully and we're not going to let up. So I'm going to switch over to this particular mannequin and show you what we really want you to do. We want you to grab any clean cloth, put it on the wound and start with both hands on a hard surface. With both hands on a hard surface, we can really direct that pressure and we don't let up. You should know that it takes your blood about five to eight minutes to clot. And the idea is, is once the clotting process starts, that helps with the controlling the bleeding. So we don't want to let up on the pressure. Once we have something else available to us or more help, we can do a pressure dressing using a gauze, you know, Curlex, an ace wrap, those kind of things and make a pressure dressing. Rob, I have a question for mm -hmm. you. When you're putting direct pressure on and it's bleeding through the first um, the first type of dressing that you use, what's the, the correct way to do it? Do you take it off nope, or you put, put an additional one on? More dressing materials right on top of it and then just continue that pressure. And then if you do have other materials, like I said, an ace wrap or um, 
playing gauze, gauze rolls, you can make a pressure dressing um, out of that. But the idea is don't let up because it, we don't want to break up those clots. Once those clots break up, the whole process starts again. So when you remove the initial dressing, you're breaking up that clotting process. Anything that's already engaged to help you clot that wound or help exactly. the individual clot. So we want to keep that on and just pile more on top of it. Now, let's say we're going back to Jessica's laceration on her forearm. I put pressure on it, but I'm really not able to stop the bleeding with that. If I have a tourniquet, which I happen to have right here, um, we're gonna apply a tourniquet. This is a cat tourniquet. These are the most common ones that we see here in Palm Beach County. And also probably the most common one in the country. These were developed and, and used over in the Middle East. In fact, every soldier is, is um, issued these tourniquets and they can be applied to yourself with one hand or you can use it um, for others. And basically it consists of a Velcro loop or a self-adhering loop, a windless rod, a little clip to put the rod in, and then this attaches over it and locks it into place. Very um, simple, but, but very effective. And once it's in place, they don't come off. And that's the problem with, that we found with makeshift tourniquets is that they tend to get loose. So, we're, so Jessica's bleeding right here. I haven't been able to really stop it with direct pressure. So we're gonna put a tourniquet on. It can go either way, doesn't matter. You want to put it at least two to three inches above where the injury is. We'll say the injury is right here. Or you can put it up higher on the extremity as well. So we'll just go up high on the extremity. So the key to these tourniquets, the CAT tourniquet, and that stands for Combat Application Tourniquet, is when you first put it on, get all the slack out of it as much as you can, and you just bring that Velcro loop right up to the bottom of the clip. Okay, so we've made it kind of tight already. Now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to use this windlass rod and we're going to twist it. And if it's tight already, it's only going to take one or two turns to actually stop the arterial blood flow because that's what we want to do is stop blood going down her arm so that we can stop the bleeding. So I'm going to put a little bit of pressure on her and you're going to lock it into place. See how it goes? Just either way, you're going to lock that into place. You're going to take the slack out of it with this one. And then lastly, we're gonna put this little clip over and that locks it into place. You can see on the tourniquet, it has a little place for the time. You can, you can actually write the time that the tourniquet was, was applied. No amputations have ever been associated with tourniquets applied for two hours or less. And in fact, over in the Middle East and in the war theater, some tourniquets are being left on for four or five hours and they still are able to salvage their limbs. So there's a couple of places where you don't want to put the tourniquet, right? If my wound is here, I definitely don't want to put it over the wound, right. and I don't want to put it over a joint, is right. that right? So we don't want to put it over the elbow or the knee on the, on the lower extremities because of those bony prominences prevent us from having that circumferential pressure that we're trying to do. What we're doing when we tighten this windlass, it's putting circumferential pressure around her, and you tighten it enough to where the, if I wanted to feel her pulse, she shouldn't have a pulse if I put it tight enough. They come in several different colors, and you'll notice that this one's blue. The blue ones are considered training tourniquets, and we use them over and over. The orange ones are typically for medical professionals, fire rescue, the hospital, we use these in our trauma center. And the black ones are more tactical for the military and police, but they're all exactly the same. The blue ones, we, because we use them over and over again, shouldn't be used for real patient situations. The SWAT T tourniquet, it's kind of like a piece of inner tube that's been cut down. And the idea with this one, SWAT stands for stretch, wrap, and tuck. So the idea here, again, same, same situation with her injury. But in this case, we're just going to wrap it. And once we get wrapping, we can make it really tight. And then the last thing is you just tuck it back in. A little bit more difficult to use because especially if the if they if, with blood if the if this gets wet it gets slippery but the idea is that we stretch and wrap it the ovals turn to circles and so on these are often used for by the police agencies and so on if you were out in the world and you didn't have a first aid kit with you and you needed to make a makeshift tourniquet just really quickly i'm just going to use a, a triangular bandage what we call a cravat and again, the same thing. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna make a half hitch 
here. Okay, so I've got a half hitch there. Now, anything I've got, a pin, a screwdriver, a stick, or whatever, we can stick in the middle here, and then just do another half hitch. We hold that, Jess? Mm -hmm. And now I've really, this is my windlass, and I can do the same thing. And I'm just gonna twist it until the bleeding has stopped. The problem with this, though, is it's not easy to secure, because I have to either have some kind of a creative way to tie it and keep it secure, or use tape, or have her, if she has the presence of mind, to hold it. But it's, again, it's effective, and it can be done in just a couple of minutes with, a, with a, um, any type of strip of cloth. With the cat tourniquet, you can actually do it by yourself. I can put it on myself. This is one of the reasons that these are the ones that are used by the military. Mm -hmm. the, the soldiers can apply it to themselves. So I can go just like that. You can see, same thing. Twist it. And we twist it until the bleeding stops. Okay, that's the key. And then it locks in place. Get the slack out and then put this over and write the time down. So applying this tourniquet it doesn't look like much. If, it, if you apply it tight enough to stop your arterial blood flow with that circumferential pressure, it hurts. And that doesn't mean that you put it on incorrectly. It doesn't mean that you should loosen it or take it off. It means that you, you need to coach the person that you're applying it to, let them know it's gonna hurt and that this is even though it hurts, this might save their life and keep, prevent them from bleeding to death. One thing that you, everyone should know is that severe uncontrolled external bleeding is the number one cause of preventable death from trauma. That's the key thing that we want everyone to know. So just like everyone should know CPR, everyone should know how to stop severe external bleeding. A couple of other things that we wanna talk about as far as tourniquets go, once it's applied, we don't take it off. Okay. Typically, it shouldn't come off until the patient arrives at the trauma center. We use these in the trauma center, and typically what happens is, is the doctors will, will use this initially. When they take it off, it's typically in the operating room, and they'll do the bleeding control, or what we call damage control surgery, which is basically stopping the bleed. Once bleeding's been controlled, then they'll go in and repair the vessel or the organ that's damaged and so on. So in an instance where a single tourniquet may be ineffective and not stopping the hemorrhage, would you be able to? Yeah, if that, in that case, which is very unlikely, but it might happen if it's a really significant severe wound, is apply another tourniquet above it. Same tourniquet, just apply two, one above the other one. And the key again, like I told you, is at least two to three inches above the bleeding site, but high on the extremities is acceptable as well. So we talked about using pressure initially, and we would always do that. If it's on an extremity, the arm or legs, if we have tourniquets available, we can use those. Lastly, if it's in a junctional area, or if it's a big wound in the same areas that we talked about, or a partial amputation or something along those lines, we can actually pack the wound with any clean dressing or gauze. In this case, we're gonna use quick clot combat gauze. What these gauzes are, or what these dressings are made of, it's a typical regular gauze dressing, but they're impregnated with a inorganic compound called kaolin. And kaolin is very similar to clay. But the thing is, is with, when kaolin, when that quick clot compound comes in contact with blood, it starts the clotting process within about 15 seconds. So the idea here is say we've got this big gaping wound, you can, I can feel all the way down to the bone. Just putting pressure on top is not really enough because all those bleeding vessels deep inside there are gonna to continue to bleed. So the idea with wound packing, the idea is just to start packing it deep into the wound. So these are very uh, beneficial for areas of the body that are yep. suffering from major bleeding and areas that may not be able to be tourniquet. You, right. uh, you may not be able to use a tourniquet. So we call those the junctional areas. So like your armpits, your neck, your groin, areas where we can't apply a tourniquet, we can still use direct pressure and we can still do wound packing. So the idea is to pack that wound until it's as full as you can get it, as much of the gauze in there as you can get it, and then you're gonna put the rest of it on top and now put the direct pressure 
just like we did before, but now it's directing that pressure deep into that wound through the, the gauze packing. And again, we're gonna hold it there until we're, we're relieved by medical responders or we get the patient to the hospital. Rob, what types of instances uh, besides the general uh, mass casualty or hostile uh, event, um, what other types of in instances or occurrences can these kits or these types of tourniquets be used? You're much more likely to need these techniques in your everyday life. Home injuries, someone's out mowing the lawn and they hit a rock with their lawnmower, the blade comes off and hits somebody in the leg. It's a massive injury. Every year or every year when we have hurricanes approaching us, at the trauma centers, we get 20, 30, 40 patients that come in with severe bleeding injuries just associated with putting those big metal shutters up. They're, they're folks that are up on ladders, they're holding shutters, the shutters come down cause really severe injuries. Motor vehicle crashes every single day. You know, we see people come in with significant bleeding injuries from motor vehicle crashes. So again, everyday injuries, and that's why we really want everyone in the country to learn these techniques. So for more information, if you wanna find a class in your area, you can go to bleedingcontrol.org. And for Palm Beach County, you can contact either Rob Moreland or Palm Beach County Fire Rescue Medical Services Division. And these courses are free. Let us know and we'll schedule it and come on out. The course takes about an hour and a half and includes both didactic and um, skills training.